Okay. Um, so the recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 212, our course on Christian apologetics. So the plan is uh, simple today. Uh, we want to finish uh, lesson 15, uh, which we've been on. Uh, um, and then, so I think we will be able to do it in, in one hour. So if you do that, then I will not be taking the second hour. We will have it free. And then next week, we'll get into our final section on social issues. You want to discuss uh, different social issues. Um, and I'll mention that, yeah, next week. But let's pray. We'll get started. Hopefully, the others will join our class soon. And um, we'll get going. Let's pray. Could somebody please lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have, God. God, I place Pastor Ashish into your hands. Be with him and guide him as he teaches us, Jesus. Help us to receive it, Jesus. Help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it, Lord. I, I pray for all my classmates over here. I pray that we'll have some good network connections over the class and nothing will be a hinder for us. Jesus, you're amazing. We love you. We thank you for everything that we that you have done, Jesus. You have called us to declare your gospel boldly, Jesus, as we learn about every single thing. Uh, you give us that understanding and wisdom and knowledge and guide us throughout the session, Lord. We give it into your hands. You guide us and you lead us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning once again. Thank you. All right. So we, uh, our plan, as I said, is to complete our chapter 15. Have we been talking about a biblical understanding of suffering? So mm, we want to just quickly review what we've done in uh, the previous lectures and then uh, bring you know, bring this to completion. And of course, feel free to ask your questions on this area. Um, it is a challenging area. It's not that we have all the answers, but to the best we can, we can study the scriptures and try to understand, uh, you know, uh, about suffering, why, is, why it is there, and what, what does God want us to do uh, in relation to all that we see happening around us. So let me go ahead, share the notes, and we'll quickly review and move forward. So we've been on this lesson for some time now. We've been trying to understand you know, why is there suffering uh, from a biblical perspective, and then we want to understand how God wants us to respond to this and you know, navigate through this as we journey through life. So we began by saying that we need to understand God's heart in the light of his original intent. You know, what did God originally intend? We said it was not his intent for suffering to be in this world of sickness and disease and pain and evil. And that was not his original intent. But we know it is there. It is there in this world. We can't deny it. There are all kinds of difficulties, hardships oppressions, all kinds of things happening. And we face it in all realms. We face it in spiritual, emotional, physical realm. There is suffering ha happening. So if you want to uh, look into the Bible and try to you know, identify this, why is there suffering? You know, we could look, we can put it down, uh, it, and this is for our study purposes. We can identify these six areas. One. Uh, is the, and we'll go through each of these, suffering due to the bondage of corruption, suffering due to one's own actions, suffering due to satanic oppression, suffering due to other people's actions, including persecution, suffering due to divine judgment, and suffering due to willing sacrifice. So we talked about the first one, suffering due to bondage of corruption, which Paul explains for us in Romans 8, basically from the time of the fall, all of creation was plunged into uh, uh, a process of decay, a corruption. Uh, 
deviation from the original desi design. Uh, uh, it was not God, God's original intent, but God gave it up knowing that he's going to redeem all of this back. He's going to bring it all back to the original state. So right now we're in that intermediate state between uh, where everything is in a state of corruption, but God will redeem all of it uh, to himself. Secondly, we said that there is suffering due to one's own actions. Sometimes we are not, we don't live responsibly. Uh, and uh, when we do things wrong, uh, we face the consequences, and then that suffering. So we shouldn't blame that on God, neither should we blame it on anybody else. Uh, but we need to take responsibility for our own actions and correct ourselves. Of course, we repent before God, and we learn from our mistakes, and we correct ourselves. And that is something all of us have to do. But God, in his mercy, he lessens the consequence of our wrong actions. That's the mercy of God. So when we repent and go to God and say, Lord, I realize what I've done. I recognize my mistake. Have mercy. Then in his mercy, he reduces, you know, he causes the impact of our wrong actions. He turns it around and he brings something good or beautiful out of that in spite of our mistakes. The third thing, the third area is suffering due to satanic oppression. So we spent some time on this where we said, you know, when we look at Job, we look at the Apostle Paul, it's very clear that it was Job, uh, it was Satan who was doing these things. And we looked at Job very carefully. Uh, it was very, you know, uh, Satan was doing these things to Job. Job didn't have the understanding that we have. You know, we have the advantage of the written scriptures, uh, which we can read and we can gain insight into the spiritual world. Uh, Job did not have that. He was faithful to God. In his limited understanding, he thought God was doing it. But in spite of it, he never sinned against God. You know, that's that's amazing. You know, he had little on knowledge, very limited knowledge. So you can't blame him that he thought God was doing it. You know, he said, God has given, God has taken away. He didn't realize or he didn't know. He didn't have the understanding because Satan was afflicting him. But in spite of all that, Job didn't sin against God. You know, and he maintained his integrity. And so the New Testament points back to Job and says, look at his endurance. And I follow his example. And we see the end of it. That is, God turned everything back. So God reverses even what the devil does. You know, God reverses and works everything out for our good. In the case of the Apostle Paul, that thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan that kept on coming against him. And, um, you know, Paul prayed, God, take this away. And God said, you know, it's not about taking that away, but it's about you depending on my grace to overcome. And we see the end of result. You know, Paul said, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Um, that means this messenger of Satan, demonic power that kept coming against him, did not succeed. Paul finished his course. And that's a lesson for us to learn, that God's empowering grace help us to over, helps us to overcome whatever the devil may throw against us. But we also made other qualifiers in the sense we said, you know, none of us qualify for a thorn in the flesh the way Paul had, because we have not received the abundance of revelations that Paul received. You know, we are walking at a different, we're walking in a different calling in comparison to the Apostle Paul, whom God revealed so much in, he, in order to write the Revelation, the New Testament, um, a major part of the New Testament for us. So we've been given weapons to overcome uh, what the enemy does. Then we came to the point, fourth point where we spent some time. We said, look, there is suffering caused because of other people's actions, including persecution. So this is where sin is in the world, people hate, people do wickedness, and they do wickedness even towards good people, innocent people. And they don't, you know, they don't feel bad about it. They don't, their conscience doesn't trouble them because their conscience has been seared and, and they go around doing evil. So 
we as believers may face persecution or evil against us because of who we are, because of our faith, because of our standing for righteousness, because of our walk of integrity, there will be things coming against us because of the actions of other people. So this is where there is that unknown, you know, for me it is still an unknown fact, uh, where on the one hand we believe in divine protection, you know, we believe in divine protection. So this is where we stopped. We believe in divine protection. We believe God is our defender. God is our fortress. No weapon formed against us will prosper. The angel of the Lord encamps around us. Until we believe in that. And yet, I do not have an explanation for why some believers actually suffer persecution. Meaning they, 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 they endure. They, are, they, they go through the hard, the hard things. Uh, I don't have an explanation for that, but if you ask me, what is your personal position? My personal position is to believe God, that God will divinely protect me. And so I go out with wisdom to serve God. You know, we don't unnecessarily put ourselves in a place where uh, unnecessarily we are at, we are putting ourselves in risk. You know, and and I and I've heard so many examples. For instance, a preacher stands in front of a temple, and he preaches against idolatry. In front of a temple, he, you know, happens here in India. So, or they give out, you know, they stand in front of a temple and they give out tracts, and the tracts are so condemning idolatry. You know, you you people, you worship idols. You need, and then there is, of course, the Hindus, whoever they would get upset. And they would, you know, start throwing stones, beating people, whatever. Now, when I look at that, or you know, and it, these things have happened, when we look at that, we say, "Look, why did you do something like that? You know, you're you're, you're causing trouble for yourself. You're going standing in front of a temple, and then telling people don't worship idols. I mean, come on, there's a better way to do it, right? Uh, to you know." Of course, we call to preach the gospel, but do it with wisdom, share it in love, and so on. You know, so in those situations when people are persecuted, then you think like, "Hey, could you have avoided that?" And it's unnecessary because you're unnecessarily doing something, you're provoking people, and it's obviously going to bring this kind of action from them. Uh, we are not here to hurt the sentiments of people, but to proclaim the truth in love. So. Um, we have to be wise. So when Jesus sent his disciples out in Matthew 10, you know, he said, see, you're going to face hardship, but people are going to hate you for my name's sake, but I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. I mean, look, I, you know, this is a very dangerous situation. You're putting sheep among wolves. But he said, I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we're not fearful. We believe in God's protection, but we have to be wise. You know, don't unnecessarily expose ourselves into those things. There are so many different ways in which we can go about uh, reaching people. So there is that walk with wisdom. Don't walk in fear. Walk in boldness and walk in wisdom. And as we go about, Doing what we call to do and belief in divine protection, believe that God will protect you. So that's my my position, but I don't have an explanation for you know why is it that some Christians or some Christians end up facing persecution in in some very very difficult ways. Uh, why didn't God protect them? Why didn't the angel of God stand and you know? preserve them at that moment? I don't have an answer. Um, but the, the thing that we must be determined in our hearts and minds is we do not love our lives even to the point of death. That means if we have to suffer to the point of death, so be it. Our commitment is to Jesus Christ. We're going to believe God for protection. He will protect us. 
But if we have to die for Christ as martyrs, so be it. So that's where we stand. We will uh, proceed now to the next few. Let me pause here to see if there are any questions, and then we will proceed with uh, the remaining areas. Let me just pause and see if there are any questions. Um, any questions so far? Oh, I just did a quick review of uh, what we have covered so far. Any questions? All right. Let's move forward. So, the fifth reason why there is suffering is because of divine discipline and also divine judgment. Now, we need to understand the difference between these two things, discipline and judgment. These are two different things. God disciplines whom he loves. God also judges. He, he, he sends judgment against what he hates, that is against the sin that he hates. So discipline is something all of God's people, believers, will face. Right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. It, it's an um, it's, um, important uh, passage, Hebrews 12. We're going to read a section, a portion of it. Hebrews 12, and let's see. Let's go from verse 5 to verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 5 to 11. Could somebody read that for us, please? Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. Somebody, please. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 11. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it mm. so this is a beautiful passage Hebrews 12 where it explains to us God's divine discipline Now, this discipline, it has to be understood in context. So this discipline that's being talked about here in Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, is God disciplining us as a father would discipline, an earthly father would discipline his children. So that's the context. It's not about judgment. Judgment is different. This is discipline. So that means this is something that happens in all of our lives as children of God on an ongoing basis. And what is, you know, what, what are some of the things we can you know, highlight from this passage? One is the discipline that, 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 that God deals with us is, is so much more in love and compassion than an earthly father, an earthly parent. See, an earthly parent, of course, disciplines uh, their children. Uh, not to destroy them, but in order to train them 
in the right way. And God does this, of course, with much more love, much more kindness. He disciplines us in order to train us in righteousness and holiness. So he says, you know, in the verse 10, the reason God does this is so that we may be partakers of his holiness. So God is disciplining us for a purpose that we could partake in his holiness. It's not uh, just, you know, don't, it's not just for his personal, you know, desire. No. To train us in holiness. We are going to be brought to a place of holiness. And again, at end of verse 12, it, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those who are trained by it. So God's discipline, God's disciplinary dealings with us is as a father, as a heavenly father. That means with much more love, much more compassion, much more patience than would be demonstrated by an earthly parent. And in even earthly parents, you know, um, uh, you know, if you just think about how they would go about it, they would initially say, "No, don't do that," and they would they would discipline through words. They would discipline through you know giving simple punishment, like, "Hey, go sit in the corner," or "You will not be allowed to play for next one hour," whatever you know, some some simple forms of uh, correction in order to help the child understand the lesson and then uh, you know in some cases they would you know and again this varies in different parts of the world I understand it I don't want to get into a debate on this but in some parts of the world they do spank the kids right for instance in India we are allowed to I know in you know in some other parts of the world that's considered abuse um, again it's just perception of how people look at it but anyway that's not the point that I want to argue about but the point I want to highlight is parents are very progressive in the way they discipline the child. Initially, it's just verbal, don't do, do this or don't do that. Then you find that then there is a little bit of more correction coming through, you know, by saying, okay, you won't get this privilege, they're removing away of privileges, you, know, you have to do this, sit in a corner or whatever, you know. And then there is, uh, in some parts of the world, like I said, they could even use the cane or something like that. But anyway, so there are these forms of correction, but all of this is done in love with the intent of the well-being of the child who is being trained to understand what's right, what's wrong, so that the child does not fall into trouble, get into error, whatever, you know, get into trouble and so on. So that, that's the way we must understand Hebrews 12, that God lovingly corrects us. His two primary ways to correct us is through the scriptures, and through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's very clear. We all understand that. You know, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it is useful. One of the things it mentions there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is for correction. So the scriptures, the God uses his word to correct us. So that's one way where loving correction comes into our lives. Second, the Holy Spirit. He guides us into all truth. He uh, tells us, you know, he can be grieved. That means when he's grieved, he's communicating to us that something we are doing or tolerating in our lives is not pleasant to him, it's not pleasing to him. So the Holy Spirit can be grieved, he lets us know he's grieved, which means we need to change. And then, of course, the, the, the fact is God uses other people. So, you know, that's why he's made us part of the body. We, he uses us to uh, shape and correct each other in love. So these are the three primary ways by which God's divine discipline, loving courage, comes into our lives by his word, by his spirit, through the counsel of the people he's put around in our lives. They're willing to speaking to us and tell us. And this is God's loving correction. It's meant to build us up. It's not meant to destroy us. It's not meant to, you know, uh, in any way, demote us. It's only meant to bring us to a level of greater holiness, greater righteousness, maturity, revelation, so on and so forth. Right? So, but what is interesting is this, that all of this, like verse 11, he says, 
No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. So, sometimes, and there are times when God's loving correction is painful. Why is it painful? Because we have difficulty in ad adapting to it, right? So, for example, God may, you know, uh, uh, we may hold a grudge against somebody. And, you know, we're kind of just going on with it. But then God begins to deal with us through His Word, or by His Spirit, or even through somebody else, saying, you need to forgive. Now, so how can I forgive? Why should I forgive? So, we struggle with it. It's painful for us. And, you know, I'm just making an example here. It's just painful for us to deal with that. So while God is telling us, you know, you need to forgive, you need to let go, you cannot hold it against that person, for us it's like, mm, you know, I'm not willing to forgive, whatever. It's painful for us. So this divine discipline, in some cases, requires a little bit, some sacrifice in our lives. Some It, it's, it brings about some discomfort or pain in our lives in order for us to obey what God is telling us. So to that extent there is, we could say, suffering in the life of a believer in that extent. Now, I'm not saying every time. You know, most of us, when God corrects us, we are ready to get in line. We say, God, I understand. I thank you so much for correcting me. I receive your correction. I, I, I just bring myself into alignment and I am choosing to do your will. So it's very simple. You know, we respond like that many cases. But in some cases, it can be difficult. We have to get our mind, our will, our emotions in line with the word of God. And that's where we have a struggle and we go through a little bit of suffering. In contrast to divine discipline, is divine judgment. So judgment is very different. When do we, and we see examples of this in God's divine judgment towards his own people. And uh, the judgment of God is always, you know, there are some things we can say about the judgment of God um, but as we look at it in scripture. It's always preceded by a call to repentance. You know, that means before God can actually execute judgment, uh, He's going to tell people, hey, you know, get back in line, repent. This is the right way. You know, whether He, he speaks through His prophets or through the preaching of His servants, some way God is calling people back to Him. When they refuse to heed that, Right? So that means they are now in rebellion. They've gone away from walking in obedience. They're continuing in rebellion and are not heeding his call to repentance. Then, at some point, God says, okay, it's time for judgment. Right? So it's not like judgment happens immediately. You know, The moment somebody sins, boom, there's judgment. No. What we see in the Bible over and over again, is that God always gives a call to repentance. He sends a messenger calling people because he wants people to find mercy. Right? He wants people, when they repent, they can obtain mercy uh, instead of judgment, that they can come back into alignment, come back into the place where God wants them to be. But if they continue going out of... Uh, what he wants, then there is judgment. Now, the, um, the, the, the judgment, remember, who is responsible for judgment? It's the people, because they were in disobedience, they were in rebellion. And then what, what really happens in judgment is we are stepping out of God's providential protection over our lives, we are stepping out of God's, because God's desire is always to protect, to preserve, to provide, uh, to bless. But in disobedience, we're walking out of that, out of His place, out of our place of covenant, out of our place of providential 
care and protection, walking out of it, then what happens? We experience judgment. Now, there will be times when God uses, you know, things uh, to bring judgment. There may be times when God lets the enemy, you know, cause all kinds of things to happen. Uh, and, 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 and so there are very different things that we see that take place in judgment. Uh, but then that judgment is also intended to force us in some ways, force us back to a place of repentance. Right? Now, if you look at that, and now we see all of that in the Old Testament. Now, when you look at it in the New Testament, what do we see? Well, in Acts chapter 5, we see some serious things happen. The book of Acts, um, Ananias and Sapphira, they did what seemed to be a small thing. They only brought a portion of what they had received from the sale of their land and brought it to the apostles. But the pretense was that, look, this is all we got. We're bringing everything. So that means they were dishonest to that extent. You know, they didn't bring 100%. They, they pretended to bring 100%, but they actually kept part of it back. So that is where the problem was. But what is so strange in Acts chapter 5 is there was severe judgment. Both fell down dead. And so we think, like, that's very severe. Because today, there are a lot of people, you're talking about in the church, who are doing wrong things, but they don't fall down dead. It just continues. Why is that? Well, one thing we can point to Acts chapter 5 is that was a season of great glory. You know, you look at Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter you know, 2, 3, 4, and 5 from the day of Pentecost. It was a season of great glory. And where there is great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. How do we know that? Well, look at the very presence of God. In the glory of God, in the very presence of God, there is zero sin. <laughs> and the, the one record that we have of Lucifer, the archangel, I mean, one of the greatest angels God created, when he sinned, he was immediately banished from the presence of God. No tolerance, zero tolerance, expelled. Who was this? The archangel, Lucifer. most likely the chief musician, the chief worship leader. Sin was found in him. Pride was found in his heart. What happened? He and all those who joined with him were banished from the presence of God, zero tolerance. So, in, so what we can say is, where there is greater glory, there is lesser tolerance for sin, and so the consequences would be severe, like we see in Acts, the book of Acts, the early chapters of the book of Acts. That is why Ananias and Sapphira, who were dishonest for, for the simple thing of not bringing the entire amount of money, they face such a severe consequence. We, that is one explanation we can give to why there was such judgment in the house of God. But then, very interestingly, when you progress later on in, in the early church, you find that sin is being in some way tolerated much more than what we saw in the book of Acts. Example, in the church at Corinth. Here's a man who is in sexual immorality and he doesn't fall down dead. We ask him, excuse me, Acts 5, they lied and they fell down dead. First Corinthians 5, a man is living in immorality. He doesn't fall down dead. What's the difference? Like I said, one probable reason, at least in my mind, in my understanding, and I mean, I can't, we can't necessarily give chapter and verse for this, that the glory that was being manifested in the early days of the early church was so great, as opposed to what we are seeing later on in 
as you know as the work expands and churches are planted and so on i think there the experience of what's happening is you know in some way now it's not as intense as before that's just my thought and um, and so here in the church at corinth they are being given the same gospel they're believing the same jesus they're experiencing the same work of the holy spirit and yet a man who is committing adult immorality, sexual immorality, Paul says, you need to put him out. The church disciplines him. The church tells you know, needs to take action. So it's not God's judgment coming in, but the church is bringing disciplinary action, putting him out until he is willing to change. And in this case, in this particular case, in current it seems like this man repented so that in 2 Corinthians, Paul is saying, okay, show kindness to him, bring him back in, uh, lest Satan should take advantage of us. So we see that. We see a different example in the case of uh, two men, Hymenius and Alexander, in the church at Ephesus. In their case, Paul says, I'm just giving them over to Satan. That means get them out of the church, release them. That means they are no longer under the fellowship of the believers. They are no longer under the oversight, the spiritual oversight of the leadership. So that means they're exposed to Satan. It's up to them what's going to happen. And in that case, it seems like these people did not repent. You can read that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, Paul still mentions Hymenius the coppersmith. He's done me a lot of harm and let God handle him. So in one case, in Corinth, the man, the church was dis church disciplined and put him out, but then he repented, so they brought him back in. The church in Ephesus, two men, they were put out, but it didn't, doesn't seem like they repented from the last record that we have. So, what are we saying? We're saying that there is divine discipline, there is judgment. God, in His glorious presence, there is zero tolerance for sin. And then in the house of God, there can be divine judgment that God Himself executes directly, or there is judgment that is executed through the church, that means through the people of God, but it's always with mercy. And if people repent, they are brought back into fellowship. If they don't, uh, they are they, they, they're, they're not brought back, which means they are left out and you know God God deals with them. So this is another aspect or another side to suffering. There is divine discipline, which we as believers will go through, but there's also divine judgment, where God will carry out judgment against sin. The next part, I'll give some time for questions before we wrap up. The next part is suffering due to willing sacrifice. That means we willingly take on suffering, we willingly sacrifice in order to serve God. You know, uh, that means we are saying, God, I could enjoy these comforts, but I'm giving it up in order to serve you or do your will. And in the process, I'm willing to endure whatever hardship I have to. Jesus said in Luke 14, 27, you know, he said, you take up your cross daily, follow me. The cross is a place of suffering. It's also a place of separation from the world. You see that in Galatians 6 14. It's also a place of sacrifice. So when Jesus says, Take up your cross, he's saying, Be willing to suffer, be willing to be separated, be willing to sacrifice on a daily basis. So this is another reason why you know some of God's people may suffer because they're willingly doing it. They give up their right to something they may have freedom to. And um, the suffering, 
leads us to greater fruitfulness. What do we mean? When we look at the example of Jesus in John 12, 24 to 26, you know, Jesus used the illustration of a corn of grain. He said, unless a corn of grain falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth more fruit. So he's using that as an example, saying, look, of course, he was referring to his own death and resurrection, but it's also an example for all of us that when we willingly give up, when we serving in our service of God, we willing to, are willing to die to self, die to things that we could otherwise have take, enjoyed, it leads us to greater fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. Right, so there is that is the outcome of these willing sacrifices that we each one of us may make for the kingdom of God. And just to kind of delve a little deeper into this, there are daily sacrifices and there are life sacrifices. You know, these daily sacrifices would be you know, things that we do on a regular basis. We separate ourselves from unnecessary things. Um, maybe it's choosing not to do things with others, or just you know, we living a consecrated life. Those are daily sacrifices. Then there are life sacrifices. That means you know, you may give up a great opportunity. You may give up other options in order to pursue what God has put before you. Uh, you may do you know? Th these are you know one-time events, but of course they impact the rest of your life. But these are refer to as life, we, I mean, we just call it life sacrifices. Uh, we do this, and God calls us to do it. But in all of this, we must keep in mind that we must do spirit-led sacrifices versus fleshly sacrifices. So what do we mean by fleshly sacrifices? That is things that are motivated by wrong reasons. You know, oh, I'll just do this to you know, impress somebody else. I'm doing it by my flesh. It's, it appears as a sacrifice, or it could be a, a genuine sacrifice, but the motivation is wrong. The motivation is to impress somebody. The motivation is to look nice in front of people or look very religious in front of people. God sees our heart, and he knows why we are do, making that so-called sacrifice. That doesn't please him if it is for the wrong reasons. We must do spirit-led sacrifices. That means something that's the Holy Spirit leads us, and He leads us to do this, and be doing it as unto the Lord. We're doing it before God, and we're doing it with joy. Those are spirit-led sacrifices, and those are the sacrifices that are pleasing and acceptable to God. Right? So keep that in mind. Right? In all of this, you must understand that there is suffering. Uh, again, this is just in general, helping us understand this whole idea of suffering, that we suffer according to the will of God. That means there is suffering that God says, yeah, go through it which means there is suffering that is not according to the will of God. We need to understand the difference between the two. And when you look at First Peter, he mentions clearly that if we are suffering for righteousness' sake, if we are suffering because we are a Christian, he calls that as suffering according to the will of God. That means God says, yeah, it's okay. You go through it, I'm with you, and it's good. So when we are suffering for righteousness' sake, when we are suffering as a, as Christian, as a, for the name of Christ, when we are suffering because we are walking as God's people, that is according to the will of God. But if I'm suffering for the wrong I have done, if I'm suffering because of what the devil is doing, that is not according to the will of God. That suffering should be avoided. That suffering you need to get out of. That suffering God works to undo. It's not His will. He doesn't want us to suffer that way. In other words, don't do wrong. You can keep yourself from facing suffering because of those, that wrongdoing. 
walk in authority over the devil. You don't have to suffer the devil's works, sickness, failure, poverty, whatever, different things the enemy does. That is not according to the will of God. That we fight. We don't tolerate that. Okay, so understand the difference between what is suffering according to the will of God and what is not according to the will of God. There's a difference here. And then this this big question: Why does God allow us to suffer? You know, I mean, we are in this world. There's so much of evil. We understand the reasoning, but why do we go have to go through this? You know, why doesn't God just put us in a safe box and just be sailing through life without any problems, without any difficulties? And sometimes you hear some teaching, you know, and I'm talking about teaching in the church that says you should know you're not going to face any trials, you're not going to face any hardships. Um, that's interesting because that's just exactly opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. That means, look, you're going to face it. James wrote, you know, count the joy, brethren, when you face these things. So, In other words, the New Testament says, look, you're going to face these things. But God's given us a way to overcome. He's told us what to do as we journey through this. So we need to have a biblical mindset as we face these challenges. What happens? We understand that character is developed through all of this. In Romans 5, 3 and 4, and James 1, 24, you know, character is developed through what we go endure. And uh, we're growing in maturity. We're developing certain things in our lives that could not be developed any other way as we journey through challenging situations. Secondly, it helps in us getting pruned, unnecessary things. We, we realize, you know, we don't need this, we don't need that. And the pruning that takes place only causes us to be more fruitful in our lives. So the pruning, the removing away of unnecessary things results in greater fruitfulness. And thirdly, Sometimes we suffer, but the kingdom of God advances. The work of God increases. Yes, we face, we may face hardship, we face difficulty, but God's kingdom is advanced. So these are the good things that come out of our enduring suffering. Our character is developed. We are brought to a place of greater fruitfulness and God's kingdom is advanced. In closing, what should our attitude be when we go through suffering? And these are things we are we have seen in scripture. You know, we must maintain our joy. Keep your joy in spite of it. You know, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your joy. Focus on the good that is happening. You know, we may not understand the, why the challenges are happening, but look at the good. And the Bible says, is any of you afflicted? Let him pray. That means you're going through difficulties? Pray. So let that challenge push you into greater prayer. Pray more during that time. And thirdly, we keep our eyes for our reward. The, the light afflictions that we face at this time is nothing compared to the glory which shall be revealed. So we look to our heavenly reward during those times. When you're facing persecution from people, you know, we, we, uh, we know that people will persecute us, we need to support those who are being persecuted. But we are not terrified. I mean, we, we take precaution, we are not terrified. We believe in divine protection, we are going to stay faithful unto death. Because we don't quit. You know. Instead, we pray for those who 
might be persecuting us. So let me pause here. I know I've uh, gone through this very quickly. Let's take up some questions um, before we uh, go for a break. And yeah, I think we'll try to finish this up so we'll get a free hour. Next one. Two quest um, questions from John Paul. First Corinthians 5. Uh, we see Paul mentioned he hands over a person to Satan. Uh, can a person's spiritual authority do this? Is this a kind of suffering as far as that person is concerned? A second question. How can we help somebody who is saying about the physical ailment in family, loss of loved ones, as God's will for dealing with them? Okay, two good questions. Let's. So the first, first Corinthians five five. What did Paul mean? Like, actually, you know, in First Corinthians five five, as well as in First Timothy, there are twice when Paul says he hands somebody over to Satan. You know, can a person's spiritual authority do this? What does this mean? Now, we have to be very careful. Uh, you know, in us doing something like this. Uh, you know, so the answer is yes, but how does it happen? Basically, it's not so much as the shepherd or the pastor or the person in spiritual authority doing it. It's really more of the consequence of, of the actions of the person who is committing the wrong. That they themselves are moving into a place that puts them out of the spiritual oversight or spiritual covering or protection that comes from a spiritual leader who is shepherding the people. So I, as a spiritual leader, I pray over my congregation. I'm just giving an example. I, as a spiritual leader, I pray over my congregation. I'm protecting them. I'm speaking the blessing of God over them. I'm praying the promises of God over them. So what am I doing? I am automatically, as a spiritual leader, through my prayer, through my spiritual you know, intercession through my proclaiming of God's word, I am protecting these people spiritually. Now, if somebody decides, I don't want to stay part of this, I don't want to walk aligned to this leadership, I don't want the, you know, the prayers of this person, the, they're stepping away in rebellion. So, what is happening? They're stepping out of the prayer that I would be praying for them. And that means they are themselves being coming out of this place of protection and in the spiritual they're making themselves vulnerable and i'm not you know we, we don't use it as a way to control people we're just doing it as our calling as spiritual overseers we pray we intercede and we're not saying hey you know if you rebel against me you're going to be exposed to satan no you know uh, if that person you know the example if that person continues in their walk with God but just decides to come out of this fellowship or go fellowship somewhere else, perfectly fine. It's not like they're going to be exposed to Satan and that's not right. But if a person gets into sin, rebellion against God, and steps out of this, so then the prayers of that spiritual overseer, whoever it is, no longer avails in that person's life because they're in rebellion against God by walking in sin and disobedience. And that's when they are exposing themselves to the enemy. And to the degree they walk in rebellion, to that degree they become vulnerable to the enemy. What will actually happen? We don't know. You know the enemy is going to do certain things. What exactly will do it vary from case to case? Is that okay, John, for the first question? Is that yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, um, you know, there are people who believe that sickness comes from God and God causes trouble and all because of, you know, maybe they've grown up with that kind of teaching, grown up in that kind of uh, environment where that is believed. Now, the best way we can is if lovingly lovingly show them from scripture that um, god doesn't do those kinds of things god is a good god he's a healer he's a deliverer you know he's the one who destroys it we show them from scripture so we do this lovingly now 
if they are willing to listen. Sometimes people are so closed in their minds, you saying believers, they're so close in their mind they don't want to listen. Then it's very hard to even open the Bible and share scripture with them. But if they are willing to listen, then little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, we can explain to them and bring them to a place of understanding that God is the healer, God is the deliverer, God is the provider, God is the protector, and it's the devil who does these things. So the answer to your second question is, you know, if they're willing to listen, we have to show them from scripture, little by little, and uh, then bring them to a place of understanding. Otherwise, we, we can't force it on them. We just have to leave it. Because sometimes people are so... They hold on to their wrong beliefs so tightly, it's hard to help them. Yeah. Yes, Pastor. Pastor, is, can I have one more small question? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Pastor, if, uh, as we discussed, suffering could also be due to one's actions. So let's, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just uh, thinking about one uh, case we had in church. Um, one person uh, uh, no, has not been great in, uh, uh, you know, bringing up their, her children. She also mentioned that. And now the child is suffering from little personality issues. Um, now, um, and she's also taking medications for anti, uh, anti-psychotic medications. Now, is uh, uh, how can we encourage them to... Um, for, for a supernatural healing, uh, uh, is there anything that they should correct now? Because it's already the child is already twenty one or twenty two. Um, so, mm. how can we help them, Pastor? Mm. So, uh, what we understand about God is God always wants to redeem. And that's the heart of God. It's the redemptive heart of God. He always wants to restore. He always wants to bring back to the original place. So we encourage them towards that. Okay, whatever has happened in the past, we can't change it. That's, that's happened already. But now, example, if the parent didn't show love towards the child, now you can change. Now you can show love. Now, you know, you can say sorry for whatever the hurt has happened. And now you can affirm love. Now you can speak. Uh, you can change. Now, because they've received understanding, they can speak affirmation. They can speak positive. They can speak the word of God, right? So that one, one thing the parent can do in their relationship toward the child. I mean, now the child is an adult, 21. So can do in their relation and affirm the adult, affirm the you know, so that itself would be a big change, which could big bring a big healing to the young adult, you know, who's 21 years old now. So the parent making a change, understanding that, hey, maybe I did it wrong in the past, but now I've understood what's the right way. Let me speak love. Let me speak affirmation. Let me be a support, be an encouragement. Let me, let me affirm the good things in my son or daughter. And that's a big thing. You know, secondly, there's a lot of prayer intercession that can happen. The parent can take the hold of the word of God. You know, take a hold of the scriptures and pray and intercede that over their child. And that's very powerful. When somebody, and in this case the parent, takes the scriptures that God has given to us for our children you know, and begin to intercede for the young adult, it can have a from God will begin to work. And then basically the parent is extending faith and prayer and intercession for the son or daughter. It'll have powerful effect. Third is the young adult can be taught the word of God. So this person who's now 21, if they discover their identity in Christ, if they understand the truth of what God has done for them on the cross of Jesus Christ, they themselves can receive healing and wholeness independent of whether the parent changes or not. You know, so we could work on it from both sides, from the parent also. More importantly, I think, the most important part will be the 21-year-old embracing the truth of the Word of God. That would be the most important, because then through that, God can work healing in uh, his or her life. Yeah.
So, Beautiful. yeah. So as pastors, you know, to the extent that they are willing to come, we can, you know, put the word of God in, and uh, you know, just build up that twenty-one year old, um, and help that person receive healing. Yeah. Yes, pastor. Thank you, pastor. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody else in class? Any any other thoughts? Any questions? Okay, I'd encourage you to take some time to go through this chapter again. I know I didn't read all the verses, but think through, read through it, think about it, try to get a clear understanding. And next week, next Monday, we'll continue. If you have additional questions, please feel free to ask. So we won't have our next class next hour, but next week, what I would request, um, what we would do is we'll get into another chapter called Social Challenges. How do we as a church respond to some of the challenges in, in society in general? You know, we talk about things like uh, marriage, divorce, go into other things like climate change, environment, and those all these different things. We need to respond as believers. How do we respond? What is the biblical response to these things? And more and more people are questioning the church. You know, what does the church say? What does the Bible say about this topic? And so we want to cover several topics. Give brief answers. We're not, not, we're not going to do an exhaustive study, but brief answers to many of these different social challenges that we are seeing and uh, be prepared to give a response to those things okay so let's pray and close we won't have the second hour and uh, then we will meet again next week could somebody pray with us please and we will dismiss anyone there's just lord we thank you for this time of learning thank you for uh, enabling pastor to share your heart lord jesus we uh, humble ourselves once again and we pray oh god that we would be able to take back the lessons and um, uh, help ourselves and also help others uh, who are going through suffering and uh, help us to understand your heart even more lord jesus as we continue to meditate on your word we pray and bless uh, each one of us and let your protection covering be upon us god we thank you in jesus name we pray amen amen Amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll meet again next week, next Monday, and continue this. God bless. Thank you for being on the class today. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.